uh, my name is Dr. Camille Brown, Associate Superintendent for Catholic Schools for the Archdiocese of Baltimore. And I bring you greetings from everyone in the Archdiocese of Baltimore. And certainly, I want to thank you for welcoming. As soon as I came through the doors today, I was so kindly welcomed by so many from the Archdiocese, uh, from the Diocese of Harrisburg. Our purpose today is to celebrate National Black Catholic History Month and also to acknowledge the contributions of men and women of color, holy men and women who have been a part of the Catholic Church. Uh, telling their stories is vital because it would seem that the contributions of uh, holy men and women of African descent in our church has been lost. So I think many of us may know about St. Martin de Porres. Uh, some of us may think that St. Peter Claver, because of his many years of service to the African uh, community, that he was of African descent, uh, but he was not. He was of Spanish descent. But what I'd like to do is just take a moment to pull you in to our seat of learning. And um, what you have, some of you have in front of you um, a saint game. And that means that we're going to have to sort of partner up. And maybe if you could get into like, just turn around or just be next to somebody uh, for about three minutes. What we'd like to do is list how many saints do you know of African descent? If you, if you are sitting by yourself, there's a... There's a paper that looks like this. There's one right next to you, so you can just reach over. You two guys have one. I know. All right, for three minutes, okay? If you cheat, it's okay. Do you have? Did this just start? Yes, I just started. You should have a pen. Do you have a pen? Okay. All right, you have three minutes. Let's see what, who you come up with. And somebody said they were going to cheat. That's okay, too. That's all right. Then let me know that you looked at the handout. Okay. So you only have three minutes. You're keeping me on task. I'm going to... Do my Vanna White impression, look. <laughs> but you gotta talk. Yes. You have to talk to make this work. Yes. Oh, be careful. Be careful, I didn't want you to bang your foot. I'm so interested in being here because we have St. Pius de Cora, mm -hmm. who uh, is from Nigeria. Oh, great. And so we're gonna take this back and, and we're gonna make him fill this out. Oh. Okay. Are we close? Three minutes? One minute? Okay, you have one minute left. Jot down names. You're talking. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. We want you to talk. Talk to each other. Say, Saint so-and-so. Write down Saint so-and-so. I know guilty. Guilty. Okay? I'm guilty. 39 years. Well, I'm now associate superintendent. I still do some things. OK, I think we're done. OK, pens down. This is like pens down. How many people came up with 20 names? Yeah, a 20. Come on, 20 for 20. Okay, how many, people, how many people jotted down 15 names? 15. No, 14. No, 11. Who has 11? No, 10. You wrote down, did you write all their names down? No, that's only one. So anyway, did anybody get to 10? No? Okay. 10? No? 9? 
Eight, seven, six. Anybody do five? Who has five? Where's the team with five? Your team has five? Okay, so you win. And what I have for you, how many in there? Four? Okay. We're going to have other chances to win stuff. That's okay. Thank you if you got five. Each one can have one. My patron, St. Josephine Bakita. Okay, the other thing that I'm going to ask you to do, I need a prefect of time. Somebody out here who's going to keep me on task. Who can keep charge of time? You want to do it for me? What's your name? Rose. All right, thank you, Rose. You're in charge of bossing me around because I like to talk. I love it. I love it. Okay, okay. So uh, give me like a 15 minute and then I might, and then a five minute. All right, so where do we begin? with our talk today. Okay, I didn't have a clicker, so. <laughs> right. So we're gonna have some wonderful stories today about black heroes who interacted in some way uh, with the Hebrew people, and also bringing us full scoop, a school, you know, full way into uh, today. We only need to look at numbers 12. In the book of Numbers, that whole chapter, is about Aaron and Miriam. They were the brother and sister of Moses. And they were really getting on Moses and were kind of upset because Moses married a Cushite woman. When you go into the Catholic study Bible, the New American Bible, the explanation at the bottom takes you to where is Cush, who are the Cushite people, and they were the African people who lived on the East Coast of Africa. So what that text tells you about is the fact that Moses married a woman of color, a Nubian woman. We also look at Jeremiah 38 to see the story of Abimelech. And we read that story all the time in our parishes. And the text says Abimelech, the Cushite, who saved Jeremiah from the cistern. And then um, what we're having here, uh, let's look in the book of Isaiah really super quick. If you're taking notes, Isaiah 18, one to two, it speaks of the powerful Nubian warriors beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. So all of these geographical areas are thrown out in the Old Testament. And most of the time we do not take an opportunity to understand the geography. In the Old Testament, they're talking about the Hebrew people interacting with people from Africa. So let's go and look in the New Testament. And perhaps we see the first image of the first African Christians. I usually start with Acts, 20, well, Acts 8, 28. Let me just tell you what that story says super quick. In the interest of time, I'm not going to read it to you. But in Acts 8, we, that's the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. And the Ethiopian eunuch is sitting in his carriage. He has his whole entourage around him. And he doesn't really understand what he's reading. And so he's reading from the book of Isaiah. And then up comes Philip. And he says, can I explain this text to you? And after Philip explains the text, the Ethiopian eunuch, which by the way, he's a, a, a man of great influence and wealth, we're told in the scripture that he is in charge of the treasury from the Candaces. And the Candaces were the queens in Ethiopia. So we have another reference here in the New Testament, our first reference. But most importantly, the Ethiopian says, what is to prevent me from being baptized right now? And Philip proceeds to baptize this Ethiopian. And in antiquity, when the head of a house is baptized or is of one faith, his whole entourage, his whole household must follow suit. So we have scriptural evidence in uh, the Acts of the Apostles that Christianity went to Africa in the first century. Why? Because the last line of that text says, he went on rejoicing. 
Now, unless something happened to that Ethiopian before he reached uh, the east coast of Africa, we know the scripture is saying Christianity went there. Okay. So, I think the next thing I want to look at is historical evidence about the historical Jesus. In Matthew 27, 32, we start to see the story of Simon. Simon the Cyrene. This man from Cyrene, he was passing on his way. Uh, Mark tells the story and he says, they pressed him into service. He was coming in from the countryside. And then we get more evidence about his children, Alexander and Rufus. He was pressed into service to carry Jesus' cross. Now, Luke tells the same story. But what I want to give you is an image that you can go home and look this up. How many people have seen the greatest story ever told? Have you ever seen that? Okay. Next time you see it, and Jesus is walking the Via Dolorosa. He's walking towards Calvary. And it's really at the ninth station that he falls, the third, he falls right? the third time. Well, in the greatest story ever told, the producers or the directors, whoever made a decision, focus in on the hands that reach down to pick that cross up. And they are the hands of the actor Sidney Poitier. And whenever I see that movie, I went, my goodness, they got it right. Because Simon, if he was Simon from Cyrene, Cyrene is an area in East Africa. He had to have been an African because of where he, he was born and that's what we know. So I think that the directors of that movie, they were faithful to the scriptural text. My point is that Christian presence is nothing new in the Catholic Church for people of color. So let's talk about towards statehood. Uh, here are the areas, I know many of us know how people become a saint. Okay, the local bishop gathers all the evidence. We have that the body becomes exhumed, venerable. Will you become venerable when your positio is submitted and approved? You are heroic in virtue. One more miracle, you're blessed, and then one more, you're saint. The only exception in our church has been if you had a martyr's death. And we'll see one picture. I'm going to show you some pictures of uh, St. Maurice and the Theban Legion. They had no miracles, but they totally were martyred. Uh, we, we're, we don't know the exact number, but their legion was somewhere between six and 10,000 soldiers, all Christians, martyred at one time. OK. So what is a saint? Someone who's been canonized. So happy we have some young people here today. You can go back and talk to your friends about it. A person who uh, in the church proclaimed as having practical heroic virtues. And the church recognizes the power of the spirit of holiness in people who believe. So why African saints? Well, first of all, the church welcomes everyone. Uh, during mass today, I had to turn around and take a picture of that beautiful um, relief that's over the archway. And you know, the church welcomes everyone, calls everyone to a, a life of holiness. So absolutely love that. I want to uh, kind of go back super quick. There's historical evidence about black Catholics with the Byzantine emperor Justinian and his wife Theodora back from the sixth century. And that evidence, I mean, you can go back and look at um, their life together and what they did uh, in the sixth century they sent missionaries to Africa. So that's historical evidence, but we have to Google uh, Justinian and Theodora to find out what's going on with them. Okay. So here is our Eucharistic prayer for All Saints Day. And I bring that up because we just said it. And the church is about renewing us in every age. It's about bringing outstanding men and women into some holiness. Okay, but we just heard that. What I wanted to say is that there are some stories I'm about to tell you. And it's important that we get their stories out. It's important that we say their names. 
So I say we have to live to tell the story so that their voices can be heard in a noisy world. There are countless saints, countless. We could not keep up with all the saints in our church. Same too of men and women of African descent. The story is there are countless. If we consider the uh, martyrs from the Alexandrian plague in 257, countless. We're unable to keep up with them. My favorite, when we talk about um, Catholic saints, when we use the term and companions, sometimes we never know what that means, how many people are with them. So saints so-and-so and companions, but we haven't said their names, except in the case of like St. Charles Luanga. That's why that team back there, I said, did you list all 21? Okay. Um, but you know, we have St. Paul, Miki, and companions, but we don't have all of their names. So for today, African saints and African stories. Am I correct that my book is available in the book? So I'm, okay, it's somewhere. Uh, and I'm going to be around um, outside the bookstore for at least till two o'clock if anybody wants me to sign it or if you want to talk further. So, St. Spiritus and Companions. I highlight them because when I talk about them, I say their story is shocking. Um, here we are, they are the first African martyrs. These folks were openly reading St. Paul's epistles. They were openly talking to one another about, well, isn't this great about Jesus who saves? The only problem is that this conversation, this openness about Jesus as a savior was not welcome in Africa at the time. And so um, I've written a wonderful section in my book about their, their talking to each other. And once they are arrested for professing Christianity, um, their persecutors just said, we need you to sacrifice to our gods, and they refused. So it would have just taken, you know, I made a mistake. But they, in their innocence, didn't know they were doing anything wrong, thinking that this message of Jesus means I have to love you. This message of Jesus is that he came to save us. What's wrong with that? So I say that they were the first and how innocent they must have been in declaring themselves to be followers of Jesus. Saints Perpetua and Felicitas. Their names are mentioned in our Eucharistic liturgy. So I want to really give some sort of image about them because the next time that we get to their feast day, usually around in February, we're going to hear their names in the Mass. So when you hear their names, here's a little bit about their story, a little snapshot. Perpetua was a noble woman, and uh, Felicitas was her slave. We're in Carthage in North Africa at 203 AD. Um, Perpetua was uh, a woman of means, and um, what I have in my book is a wonderful account of Perpetua's diary. She tried to talk about once they were arrested, their life in prison. Uh, Perpetua was a, um, a mother. She turned her child over to her father. And there's a wonderful story that her father came to prison really to shake her up, you know, like a dad would do. My daughter's in jail and professing to be a Christian, and I need to shake some sense into her because she's going to be killed soon. And so the dad comes to jail and to the prison and he says, look, I want you to just say you're, you made a mistake, you're not a Christian. She said, I am what I am. And she said, can a vase be called anything other than a vase? She kind of made me think about St. Paul, all right, in his epistle. I am what I am. You can't change that. She said, I can't be called anything other than what I am, a Christian. And she and Perpetua were taken into the arena, and uh, they met their martyrdom there. Um, but I think the piece that I really want to highlight about these two women, while they were in prison, they converted the guards to Christianity. So what a sign. And then St. Maurice and the Theban Legion. 
I started talking about him. He's got a great, great story. Uh, we're at 287 AD, and he's a general, Maurice. And he was ordered to take his troops to Gaul, which is present-day France. And in Gaul, they were supposed to put down the Christian rebellion. There was no rebellion. There were just people there who wanted to be uh, aligned with Jesus. So he gets there, and then he finds out that the emperor really wanted them to kill all the Christians. And he refused. And his men refused. The story goes that he had many opportunities. The first opportunity, uh, the emperor said, we're going to ten, kill 10 men. OK, they all sacrificed themselves. And 10 at a time, all of the legion perished until everyone was gone. It's just a, an amazing, amazing story uh, about them. And again, he was the one. There were no miracles. So today, if you um, are a weaver or a swordsmith or you're someone who has gout, pray to him. OK. And now I wanted to bring this um, story to light because sometimes we do not talk about married people. We think priests and religious, they're the only people who can and aspire to sainthood. Saints Timothy and Mara were newlyweds. They had only been married for 20 days. And Timothy's job in the church was to hold on to the sacred text. So in 298, what does that mean? All right. It means that he had the book of all of the Christians in the area. And during the time of anti-Christian persecution, he was ordered, give us that book. Well, turning over the book would have meant sacrificing all the other Christians. And he refused. He was arrested, still no movement. So the uh, soldiers then arrest his wife. And she encourages him. Have courage. Don't give those books up. And so she too was arrested and both were martyred. I know many of the stories today, I keep using the word shocking. Because in the, in the beginning of our Christian heritage, especially in Africa, um, what's wrong with loving someone? That was Jesus' message. So we have St. Cassian. I call him a saint for justice because he was just performing his duties as a clerk. And um, in court, Christians were brought in. They were sentenced to death. And the story goes that he had had enough. And he took his notepad and threw it down and proclaimed that this is wrong. Well, in very short order, he too is arrested. And he too is martyred. I always, when I think about um, St. Cassian of Tangiers, all he had to do was keep his mouth closed. Isn't that true? But that's a great sin even in our world today. When men and women remain silent, what happens? Evil has a chance to rise up. And we've had many, many situations in history where that has happened, with the transatlantic slave trade, with the Holocaust, um, more modern times, Rwanda, Bosnia, Syria, present-day human trafficking. Some of us still are not on the path of knowing that this is still happening. It's a reality. We have to speak out because we're men and women of goodwill. Correct? Is that? OK, we're good with that. OK, um, St. Moses the Bat Black, he's one of my favorites. And I'll tell you some stories about him. Um, he is one of the prime examples where God lets us know it's never too late to come to me. But St. Moses, um, he was a, a, a slave. And he was so bad at being a slave, uh, he created havoc in the household. Whenever they sent him on a tour, he would spend the money or beat up somebody along the way. And finally, he was kicked out of the household, just out into the street. And while he was out in the street, he was a villain. That's the best word for him. That he assaulted people, beat up people, stole from people, and then one day had a conversion experience and became a monk. Now we are, his life went from 330 AD to 405 AD. But once he had that conversion experience, 
St. Moses the Black was the best monk for Jesus ever. Um, I, I'm firm about saying he's the outlaw saint because he went from this to this. And again, he offered hope that any of us could turn our lives around, any of us. So I think my last two people that I want to talk about in antiquity are St. Augustine and his wonderful mother. And I always have to throw wonderful on top of St. Monica. St. Augustine was a doctor of the church. He was born in North Africa in an area uh, now uh, known as Algeria. So he's controversial. And now why is he so controversial? For a lot of reasons. One, um, he was always searching for some meaning. He was an academic. Um, lots of heresies that uh, he embraced. He was easily bored, he was short-tempered, and he just moved from place to place to place. Um, one of the things that I want to uh, cite about him and St. Monica is that there's a story that says St. Monica prayed for her son's conversion for many years, and she used to follow him around. So if he was in Carthage and he was going to Rome, she'd show up in Rome. And if he was going um, to Milan, all of a sudden she'd show up there. There was a story that said one time he was leaving um, uh, Carthage and his job was that he was going to sail to Rome. And St. Monica wanted to go with him. So she shows up at the pier and he says, okay, I'm going to get you passage. So you wait here on the shore. And next thing we know, St. Monica sees the ship sailing by. But he, he was, of, what he did basically was left her behind. But she persevered in praying for her son. So she booked passage and she was right on his heels. She wanted her son to be a Christian. And he ended up having his conversion experience in uh, 387, right at Easter time. And that's when we have that wonderful text about, you know, our hearts are, are restless till they rest in you which we're all aware of. So um, the other controversy that I mentioned about uh, St. Augustine, some want to argue that he was of European descent. And if you read some of the research, especially that of Father Cyprian Davis, who wrote the history of black Catholics in the United States, he says that that's not possible. Um, because in North Africa and present day Algeria, more than likely, St. Augustine looked like the people of that area. And they were people of color. He might have had curly hair, but uh, he, he says, Father Davis says, that there is evidence that he could not have possibly been, had blonde hair and blue eyes. So there lies the controversy, and we are still going back and forth about what does St. Augustine look like? So his beloved mother, St. Monica, raised in a prominent um, Catholic family, she was forced to marry a, a pagan husband who was of some means, but he was very abusive, uh, very un uh, unfaithful, and ignorant about Christianity. Like he would wait, wait until it was time for her to go to Mass and say, I want you to do this. And she would do it patiently and then run off to Mass. I call her the counselor saint because the other women of Carthage and Tagast which was in North Africa, could not understand her. And so she counseled them in their lives. And on her husband's deathbed, he converted to Christianity. But just unbelievable. So let's move ahead. Oh, am I out of time? Oh, OK, real quick. I'm not going to tell all the stories. Let's skip this one and go to some pictures. Pictures. Pierre Toussaint. Nope, oh, one back, right there. Pierre Toussaint, modern day people that I'm going to ask you to pray for. Pierre Toussaint um, from Haiti in America. He was a slave, a hairstylist for wealthy women uh, in New York. He helped women uh, with their religious communities like Mother Mary Lang and also Elizabeth Ann Seton. So uh, I have to tell you this real quick story. He is the only lay person buried at St. Patrick's Cathedral. If you go down into the crypt, you see Fulton Sheen. Right next to Fulton Sheen is Pierre Toussaint. All right? So, but he's venerated. 
So let's move on to the next. I'm just looking at time. Servant of God, Mother Mary Lang. She's from Baltimore. Uh, Mother Lang founded uh, the first successful religious community for women of color. Uh, the Oblate Sisters of Providence are still uh, in ministry today in Baltimore. And what we want to point out with them is Mother Lang's cause is moving very quickly, and we pray God that she is venerable in 2019. So we have to keep praying. Okay. Henriette Delil is already venerable Henriette Delil. Sisters of the Holy Family in New Orleans. Very, very active at Xavier University. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, their task, she was a free woman of color. And the expectation for her was that she would um, attend the Quadroon Ball. What happened at the Quadroon Ball is that uh, free women of color would go there and, and they were expected to um, come together, not in marriage, but come together with some of the white plantation owners. She refused to uh, adhere to custom. And that was great because what ended up happening, Sisters of the Holy Family. And they educated uh, children, they opened centers for the elderly, and cared for sick people of New Orleans. I want there's some excitement around the next person, Julia Greeley. She's very, very, very new, servant of God. Julia of Gre Julie Greeley is known as Denver's Angel of Charity. She was a slave, and while she was a slave, you'll notice on her icon painting that her eye is damaged. Her mother was being beaten by a slave owner, and the part of the whip hit her in her eye and destroyed the eye. So after slavery is over, what does she do for the rest of her life? She worked for white families taking care of their children. But at night, she went around leaving food. She took off her earnings, bought food, and if you were starving, she would leave food outside your house. She was known to, to walk around the streets at night carrying mattresses on her back. If you were in poverty, you might wake up and have a mattress in the front of your house, and you don't know where it came from. But she, she was just this sort of person who did that. Uh, I would encourage you, there's a wonderful book that's called In Secret Service of the Sacred Heart, The Life and Virtues of Julia Greeley. Or just Google Julia Greeley and find out more about her. Her cause, too, is moving along. And Blessed Victoria Rasamanaria was from Madagascar. And I apologize if I'm moving rather fast, but I want to just kind of throw their names and stories out. And if you don't do anything else but take the handout, go home and Google these people to find out more about them. Blessed Victoria, she was a woman ahead of her time. I call her the persistent lay leader because she was born to parents in Madagascar who worship ancestral gods. But the Jesuits were quite active in Madagascar, so active, in fact, that the government threw them out. And for three years, Julia kept the doors to the churches open. She kept religious education going. And so when the Jesuits were allowed to come back, they found a vibrant church. And it really was because of her. Uh, her parents tried to stop her with this Christianity, with this Christianity thing. Uh, so they married her off to a pagan, the prime minister's son. And she lived with him for 23 years, and he was abusive to her. But on his deathbed, he converted to Christianity as well. Uh, quite interesting that Julia, during her lifetime as a Christian, uh, said, I do not want to be buried in the ancestral tomb because that's where all of the other ancestors were. And they were like threatening her. The families were threatening her. And so she decided, I don't want anything to do with it. But at the end of her life, so many people saw what a good woman, that it was a big deal all throughout Madagascar. OK. Uh, servant of God, Father Augustus Tolton. He, too, born into slavery, uh, escaped with his mother and siblings. I think that this man was brilliant, and history hasn't yet said that he was brilliant. But his mother uh, escaped, and she ended up in Quincy, uh, Illinois, and Chicago. And the local priests kind of took him under their arm, and they taught him 
all of the languages. He knew Greek, he knew Latin, he knew French, all of these languages. And then, because he could not enter a seminary in the United States, he was then sent, he, uh, yeah, okay. He was then sent uh, to Rome to study for the priesthood. Uh, that second picture is the most historical picture because if you read the caption in the uh, newspaper in Philadelphia at the time, they have him as the most recognizable man in America because he's the first recognizable African priest. There were three ahead of him, but nobody recognized them of African descent, the Healy brothers. Okay, St. Josephine Bakita, um, she's been my patron saint for many, many years, and she is just a woman of forgiveness. Uh, her body is incorrupt. I've had time in Chio, Italy, to spend at the mother house just on top of her. Click, 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 click. They let me do all these click clicks. <laughs> I know. So, um, but the thing that I want to talk about her, she was a Kenosian sister of charity. And her biggest thing is that she said, if I knew about the risen Jesus, how much better I could have endured slavery. Just phenomenal, phenomenal. Okay. And then, uh, so who am I at next? Uh, Blessed Anne-Yuri Nengapetia. I call her a martyr, uh, a saint of chastity. Uh, very young, 24 years old. She was a sister um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, became a wonderful teacher, loved by so many other people. And um, during the war, the um, general tried to rape her. And she said, I'd rather you kill me. And he did. Just a, a fantastic life. So where are we going from here? Uh, again, I'm encouraging everybody to Google all of these people. And then excitement. Say, here we go. Sister Thea Bowman. Many, many, many people know about her. I wanted to invite you to join us in prayer because uh, November 11th of this year, the US Catholic bishops are coming together to look at her cause, to see if the Catholic bishops of the US can endorse her cause moving forward. I called her a religious, smiling, celebrating sister, and she talked a lot about what does it mean to be black and Catholic in the church. And her response was, we have to bring our whole selves, you know, our worship, our liturgy, our history, all that we are to the Lord because he created us as we are. So I do uh, just encourage you to, I know we only have a couple of minutes left, but it's about us. That's what this all boils down to. We have great images in our church. What are we going to do? God has a wonderful work plan for us, and I pray that when uh, he calls us, we're going to be ready to answer because he calls us to be saints, to be missionary disciples, to tell everybody we know that God loves us. And that's a big deal, I think. It's a super big deal. So I do want to thank you. I want to be faithful to our time.